Hello, today I'm joined by Terry Smith, the manager of the Fund Smith Equity Fund. Terry, thanks very much for sparing the time to talk to me. Yeah, pleasure to do so. I mean, you, you bought a stake in Apple last year. Yeah. Um, you know, you could argue that quite a lot of the big returns have have been made on that stock already. Um, you know, the story hasn't really changed too much. It's, you know, it sells lots of phones and, um, you know, laptops. But wh- why did you only buy last year and, and sort of not years ago? Well, there are lots of answers to that. I'll start with the most strikingly honest one because I'm an idiot, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so let's get that on the table straight away, shall we? <laughs> I should have bought it on the day we launched the fund, right? Um, however, and I'm going to come back to whether anything's changed in the story or anything else. I'm going to give you a quote, okay, here. Um, and, uh, and it's several times every year, a weighty and serious investor looks long and with profound respect at Coca-Cola's record, but comes regretfully to the conclusion that he's looking too late. The spectres of saturation and composition rise before him. Now, who said that and when? Is that a Warren Buffett quote? Right? You're, yeah. you're half right there, Daniel. Well done. <laughs> Warren Buffett quoted that in his 1993 letter to shareholders, and fairly obviously, Coca Cola has been a pretty good performer since then. So otherwise, I wouldn't be using it, would I? However, Warren was actually using a quote from somebody else. It was in uh, the 1938 issue of Fortune magazine. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great quote. And let's just start at the end. Me buying into uh, Apple at 125 bucks away, we paid roughly for the for the stock in, uh, in uh, to start holding in November. Um, it clearly isn't as good as buying it at, uh, at six bucks, right? I mean, I don't I don't really need somebody to. Really, yeah, that's why I confessed at the beginning of this. But equally, if we think that there's value in here and it's a very good business. Looking in the rearview mirror at what you miss isn't going to help you. Those shares that went from, you know, sort of six bucks to 125 bucks didn't know that we didn't own it, right? They weren't sitting there thinking, oh, we won't go up to fully reflect the value of this business until Terry Smith pulled it up. So <laughs> our, jo- our job is not to explore history, although, as you probably get, that's why I ask a lot of questions and the way I write and so on. I quite like history. I'm a historian by training, but we have to think about the future. That we can only buy the future, we can't buy history. Uh, and so it's really whether or not where is it going to go from here? And we bought when you say nothing's much changed about the stock. I'm not sure that's right. The thing that I would put to you that I think has changed about the story is this thing that I was during most of this period quite dismissive about, but I'm becoming convinced is a reality. For want of a better term, I don't like the ecosystem. The services part of the business. The services part of the business is now getting on for a third of the revenues. This part of the business has 70% gross margins, which are twice the margins that you get in the in the handsets, um, uh, tablet uh, and devices part of the business. And it's growing at about twice the rate of the remainder of the business. And it clearly is far more a thing of the sort that we like. Selling services based upon an installed base of equipment is exactly what gets us into things like the elevator and escalator business or the testing equipment business. Um, and so that, I would say, is the one thing that's not exactly changed. It's changed a bit because obviously it's grown. It's grown when it's growing at twice the rate. It must, it's got to the point where I go, yeah, I think Apple TV, Apple Music, Apple Pay, it's real. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to keep coming. So that's one thing which I would put to you has changed. Um, the other thing I would put to you, and you might say, tell you, you could have spotted that a bit earlier. Yeah, but I mean, once it gets to a certain size, you go, well, look, I'm afraid this is what it's got to a The other thing that has changed was the share price. I mean, this this is a company at $180 at its top, and we were buying it at $125, and we're still buying it at about $140. So it is about a third off its peak, basically speaking. Uh, and so the combination of those factors are really what got me there. Is there a similarity there with you, you taking a position in Amazon as well? Obviously, that the, the price was cheaper. Very um, similar. Yeah, yeah. I know it's exactly the same story. Which is, um, you know, we sat there for quite a while looking at Amazon, uh, saying I, I didn't debate whether I like Amazon Web Services. I own Microsoft with, uh, uh, with the, the, the other leading position in cloud. Um, the e-commerce business I debated. It's kind of like I, I, you coming to the conclusion that this business does have very good returns, um, but they are somewhat masked, well, from time to time by 
the bursts of recycling back into the growth of the business that they do that that they voluntarily depress the returns with and that it's got some other businesses which are growing quite well which are under recognized and the digital advertising business uh, i think is one you know we're talking about a 30 billion dollar business growing up 50 percent per annum kind of thing because they've got first party data i always say if i go on to amazon and try and buy a new um heart rate monitor you know uh they they know very well they might be out selling some exercise equipment it's pretty, <laughs> pretty good stuff um and uh you know th those things i think um uh were pretty convincing for us um and you know, the fact that we've missed a certain part of the return comes back to the 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 Forbes, uh, sorry, the Fortune uh, Warren Buffett quote, which is, yeah, okay, you have. That means that means you're obviously stupid, but you know, don't be stupid, don't don't double down on stupidity by letting that affect whether you think you should do something now. Yeah. What I mean, what what do you think would be the biggest mistake you've made with Fundsmith portfolio since the fund was launched, and, yeah, and what might you've learned from that? Uh, well, it comes back to an early part of our conversation, Dan. Look, uh, I, I, I can tell you some mistakes of commission that I've made. Um, you know, like you said, you're buying metro, it's difficult stock to own. And uh, after an initial bit of uh, success at the moment, we've made no return, fairly obviously. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I think the biggest mistakes are the ones that, that really get mentioned in the mistakes of omission rather than commission. So, yeah, I buy it, it goes wrong. I mean, it's obviously it's sitting there in the portfolio. So it's a fairly obvious thing for you, investors and me to sit there and focus on. How about the things I didn't buy? And I think you've actually sort of already alighted upon a couple of them, which is why didn't I buy Apple and Amazon on day one? Those are, mm. those are the good mistakes. It's the, it's the mistakes of omission, I think, which are the ones. Now, the reason they occur is we're trying to own a portfolio of 20 something stocks, which represents some of the best businesses in the world. And our biggest problem is when we get one wrong because we don't have a very uh, wide portfolio uh, yeah, with, uh, out there. And so that tends to somewhat um, uh, sort of affect our thinking to the point where we make estates of omission, I think. And we probably need to adjust our sets slightly in, in that regard, would be my view.